This is going to be a brief introduction to the capital asset pricing model, the CAPM, appropriate for intro to finance students, students that have never seen the CAPM before. Usually, uh, in the CAPM, capital asset is a stock or a bond. Normally, this is used for stocks. Before we start, I'll note that more formally, the CAPM would start with the knowledge of Markowitz portfolio optimization. So this approach to the CAPM doesn't assume Markowitz portfolio. They, they, you've, they're familiar with Markowitz portfolio optimization. We're just going to start right here. And what we have is the return on some capital asset, the return on the actual return on capital asset I is equal to the expected return plus some unexpected portion. And then what we can think about is if the un unexpected portion of the return in stock, there's really two kind of types of uh, unexpected returns. It could be unexpected returns that affect all stocks. Uh, so in other words, interest rates go up, uh, the, the uh, stock prices go down, or appropriate for now, um, there's a global pandemic and right, all stocks go down. So, so this in this unexpected return for the stock, there could be um, there could be unexpected drivers that affect all stocks, but there also could be uh, firm-specific factors that affect the unexpected return. So, in other words, if I'm if I'm a car maker, there could be a fire in a factory, which makes my stock go down. Or if I'm a, if I have a social network, a lot of people start using my social network, and my stock goes up. So, in other words, what we can do is we can break this unexpected return into a portion of the unexpected return that is that affects all stocks, and one and a portion that affects only that particular stock. So that's why I have M with no subscript here, and then the firm specific here with a subscript I for that, for uh, stock I, capital asset I. Note, you could say, well, there's industry specific factors like uh, the um, oil prices go down, it, it, it affects all oil stocks and so forth. Uh, forget industry specific. Uh, here we're just talking about uh, affects all stocks, only affects the individual stock. So these, this is going to be called uh, uh, systematic and, and non-systematic. Now, the, the, uh, the important thing to realize here, and I have this kind of written, but in words, what we mean here is keep in mind the correlation between the firm-specific portion of the unexpected return uh, is zero between all these different stocks. So there's a, like I said, there's a fire at a car factory, but um, the, there's a a lot of people start using my social network, and as I start averaging over all stocks more and more and more, uh, the sum of all these firm-specific factors goes to zero, right? So in, in, keep in mind, in the background here, uh, the CAPM assumes uh, Markowitz, and as a result of Markowitz, everyone's holding a large portfolio. So kind of in the background, you don't have to worry about it, but um, we assume the market portfolio, everyone's holding the market portfolio. So the idea is if everyone's holding the market portfolio, this M is large, and the firm specific factor amount of our return goes to zero. So this leads us, so the idea here is, we can get rid of this simply by uh, diversifying, by adding more stocks. But as we add more and more stocks, we, we can't get rid of that, right? We can't get rid of the, the uh, systematic portion. This is, uh, this, is, this is called systematic you know, risk or market risk. So you'll hear me use those interchangeably. We can't get rid of the market risk or the systematic risk. Incidentally, um, you can think of sometimes when the market crashes, some people, I, I've heard people say this, uh, you know, uh, how did I lose so much money? Um, I was, I was diversified, right? So right here, keep in mind, if you're fully diversified, you are still holding market risk, right? Diversification does not get rid of the systematic risk. Uh, it only gets rid of this firm specific risk. So if you hold the market and the market crashes, you know, you're, you're, um, you're going to lose, uh, uh diversification won't help you. All right, so this leads us to the systematic risk principle. And at, now this is as it's written in most textbooks, right? So I use a, 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 a widely used text to teach you know, the intro course. And this, this is how it's said in that text. An asset's expected return depends only on that asset's systematic risk, systematic risk, market risk. I added this, not on the unsystematic. See, reading that, it's a little bit misleading. What it's saying is the expected return only depends on the systematic risk, not on the unsystematic risk, right? So that's why I, I wanted to add this piece here. But taken literally, this is not correct. The asset's expected return depends on the asset's systematic risk and other factors. Uh, the other factors, what we're going to see is it depends on the risk-free rate and, the, and the, the price of risk. So don't take that as I can get the expected return on an asset only given its systematic risk. That's the only asset-specific piece of information I need to know. 
I need to know that asset system address, and then you give me that, and then I can add some other pieces to it and give you um, the expected return on the asset. So that's an important thing to realize when you read this definition. It's generally in bold and a lot of text, and, and it, it's just saying it doesn't, this has no bearing on uh, the expected return on an asset. Again, underline this is assume you're holding the market portfolio. So, um, it, oh, uh, another way of saying this, like keep in mind, what we're saying, what we're gonna, what we're gonna say here, and a big takeaway of the CAPM is the standard deviation of the asset uh, is not uh, doesn't come into play here. It's actually how that uh, um, when I add that asset to my portfolio, how does it affect the standard deviation of my overall portfolio? Right. So uh, that's a very important takeaway. But so another way of saying this. Uh, is you're not paid for taking unnecessary risks. So that's the way I usually often say it in class is, keep in mind, underline this is a very important principle. If you take a risk unnecessarily, the market will not compensate you for it. And that's what's going on here. Somebody has to hold the market risk. So if you hold this, the market will compensate you for it. Right? But if you hold this, the market says, well, you don't have to, so I'm not going to compensate you for it. And that's a big takeaway of the CAPM, right? Uh, you're not compensated for holding unnecessary risk, but you are compensated for holding risk that we have to hold, the systematic, the market risk. All right. So here we're just going to define, right, uh, this beta, beta of asset I. We're just defining this as the amount of the systematic risk in an asset I relative to the average asset. So the average asset is the market portfolio. So the beta of the market is one. The, the, the beta of the average asset is one. So if we have some security that has a, a, a beta, you know, uh, let's just say asset J is two. This has twice as much systematic risk as the market. Now, in an intro course, you know, I, I won't test on sort of the this year, but we, we can actually calculate beta as the covariance of the return on that asset I with the return on the market divided by the variance in the market. So again, what's going on here is, um, the, you know, the, the amount of systematic risk is, is this is different than the, than the standard deviation of the asset. This is, uh, again, it's, it's a measure of how this asset varies with the market. Uh, because if it's highly correlated, you know, if, um, if it has twice the amount of systematic risk and the market crashes, you're going to lose, right? So you have to be compensated for holding that, right? So the idea here is you're going to be compensated for holding these high, uh, any sort of stock that has a high beta and not to be compensated for holding stocks with a low beta. So, so, but this is risk. So this is an assets, you know, when we look at an assets risk, it is only the systematic risk that, that matters. So what we can do is we can look at the reward to risk ratio. So the idea here is this is the, the risk premium on, on asset A. The expected return on asset A minus the risk free rate. Right? And then we're dividing, so this is return, and we're dividing it by risk, which is the beta of asset A, the amount of systematic risk in the asset. Similarly, we can look at any other asset B. Right? This is the return uh, for holding asset B, this is the risk in holding asset B. So the idea of the cap M is that, well, we can't have this. So this is the, each of these ratios is the return per unit risk. So the question is, would anyone hold, you know, uh, if this were the case, would anyone buy B? You'd say, well, no, because you'll get more return per unit risk for in A. So what, what happens is, is everyone sells B, which increases the expected return. If, they, if you sell the asset, the asset goes down, but that means the expected return goes up. So everyone sells B, increases the expected return, buys A, lowers the expected return until these are equal. Note this is an equilibrium argument, not an arbitrage argument. So what this is saying is everyone changes their portfolio. So remember, an equilibrium argument is a little bit looser. You know, this is, it's, it's not held exactly like, like if we were to talk about arbitrage. So using that argument, we'd say, okay, well, the reward to risk ratio should be the same for every asset in the economy. So if that's true, then it should also hold for the market portfolio. So what I can do is just replace, you know, B with the market. And then if I, the beta of the market, remember, is one, right? So uh, I saw this, right? So in other words, replacing B with the, uh, so this would be the, with the market, expected return on the market minus risk free divided by beta of the market, which is equal to one. Uh, I rearrange this and I get my cap M equation, right? So this is the famous cap M equation that, uh, you know, is on every intro to finance exam and so forth. So let's just take a brief look at this. 
right? Because what is this telling us? Well, this is telling us that the expected return on any capital asset is a function of the risk-free rate, which is the pure time value of money, the amount of systematic risk in the asset, and the, the reward for bearing systematic risk. See, this is one of the things that students miss, or it's not often pointed out clearly enough, that this is a reward for bearing risk, right? Uh, so, in other words, this is usually shown in the SML, where we have the beta and we have, you know, we have the expected, you know, expected return here. In, in your text, at some point, it's going to say, all right, well, this, this is the uh, S security market line, right? And everything should plot on the security market line, meaning all assets should plot here. This is the slope, um, uh, and, th and this is the slope of the security market line. We can see that by just saying, okay, well, this is the expected return on the market. Um, uh, and then this is beta of the market. So the slope of this line, expected return on the market minus risk free divided by beta of the market. So uh, this here uh, is known as the market risk premium. This is the slope of the SML, right? So the idea of this is everything should plot on this line, but if this line was steeper, then you would get a higher expected, you'd get more return for bearing a unit of risk. So you, what you can think of is um, the steepness of this line tells you how much the, mo the market will, will reward you for, for bearing a, a unit of market risk, right? So this is, it's also how scared the market is. So what you can see now when the market is crashing, the idea is when, the, when everything's fine, this, this might be a little bit flatter, but the idea is when the market starts, you know, if it's a little bit flatter, you get lower for holding a lot, for holding more systematic risk, you get less return, but then it gets steeper, right? And you're getting more return for you know holding less risk, right? So the idea here is what the cap M is saying is the expected return on the asset is uh, uh, equal to uh, is a function of the pure time value of money, right? Times uh, the amount of systematic risk. No, oh, sorry, the the pure time value of money plus the amount of systematic risk times the reward for bearing that risk. So what we have is a reward for bearing risk, amount of systematic risk, pure time value of money, right? So that's where this gets a little, it's, it's not dependent only on the asset systematic risk. On the asset systematic risk, that, but uh, the asset systematic risk, the reward for bearing risk in the market, right, and, and the pure time value of money. The one the last thing to note here is, of course, this is the only asset specific factor here. This is the same for all capital assets, for all stocks. This is the same for all stocks. So what this is trying to say here is the only asset-specific factor we need is the amount of systematic risk in the asset. Then all we have to do is take the general market, you know, the reward for bearing risk in the market, which is the market risk premium, you know, right here, and then the pure time value of money, that should be, you know, that's risk-free, uh, and then we can get the expected return on any asset. So this is the powerful thing. As soon as I know the expected return, uh, the amount of systematic risk on any asset, then I know um, the asset's expected return. That's the only factor I need. Great. Uh, have a great day.